Hello, everyone. I'm Jessica Pedrick. I'm going to be our moderator today. So before we get started really getting into it, um, we're going to do a little icebreaker, um, kind of get to know our panelists, and then we'll, we'll dive into it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask everyone, what would be your superpower? So there are some options. You can be, you can teleport, um, invisibility, mind reading, um, pretty much anything you already have could be your superpower. So I think that I would go with um, invisibility. I think invisibility would be cool. Um, I could just invisibly get on a plane, which is kind of like teleporting. I could just invisibly go in a room and hear conversations, which is kind of like mind reading. Um, so yeah, I would go with invisibility. Um, JP, what would be your superpower? So I think my superpower would be controlling the weather and also being able to fly. Just like an X-Men storm, she's always been my favorite. I always wish I had her superpower. So that's what I would choose. Love it. Um, Early, what would be your superpower? So I'm a huge Harry Potter fan and I would love to be able to operate and just go from one place to the other, just anywhere I wanna go, just like there. Awesome. And Tariq, what would be your superpower? For sure, my superpower would be teleport. I, I just love the idea to be able to be in one place in one second and be in another in the next second. So I think that worked for me for sure. Awesome. Um, well, I'm glad all of you are choosing to be here now. Um, and we're actually going to ask the folks who are, who are coming in and joining us what their superpower would be. Oh, we're getting responses. So there's going to be a poll on your screen. And go ahead and just pick your superpower. A lot of folks for mind reading. <laughs> <laughs> teleportation close second I don't know JP it looks like you might be flying in the air by yourself nope there's one <laughs> all right yep teleportation's definitely taking the lead and some people already have a superpower awesome all right and, and we have closed our poll. So now the result is teleportation. It looks like I can um, stop sharing the results. Okay, yep, teleportation for the win. Awesome. All right, thank you for, for participating in that with us. It is one o'clock, so we do wanna get started. Um, it's, a, it's a big topic with lots to cover and we, we only have the hour. Um, so again, my name is Jessica Pedrick. I use she, her pronouns. I am the clinical manager of special projects at Integral Care. Um, Integral Care is the local mental health authority and also the local authority for intellectual and developmental disabilities in Travis County. Um, we've been around for over 50 years. We provide substance use services, mental health services, IDD services to children, adults, anyone in Travis County and, and even beyond now. Um, and today we are partnering with What's in the Mirror to bring this uh, discussion to you. And so What's in the Mirror is a social movement to bring awareness to mental health and suicide prevention through art and advocacy to communities of color. And so together we're going to have a discussion today about mental health and well-being in the LGBTQIA community. And just to let everyone know, we are recording this um, and we are streaming live on Facebook. So, so we could have lots of viewers. Um, we want to talk about this topic today because of the history of violence, stigma, and bias against the LGBTQIA community that has created a number of health disparities um, for us now. So for example, um, LGBTQIA folks are two and a half times more likely to experience depression, anxiety, and substance misuse as compared to heterosexual folks. And you know, we really want to work together to decrease that dis disparity and provide as much support as possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists for today. Um, so first we have Tariq Daniels using he, him pronouns. So Tariq is an Afro-queer writer, performer, and certified mental health peer specialist, and also an HIV awareness advocate. He's also the founder and executive director for What's in the Mirror. So thank you so much for partnering with us today. Um, <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, we also have JP Cardenas using the them pronouns. JP is a queer mental health clinician. Um, they're an active board member for two local LGBTQIA plus nonprofits, and they also are on the advisory board for Austin Public Health related to LGBTQIA communities. Thank you, JP, for joining us. <laughs> and we also have Early Barnes Ulrich using she, her pronouns, who's a school-based therapist for integral care. She's a lesbian who uses a vast array of therapy modalities in her work. She uses trust-based relational intervention and EMDR, and we're really excited to have her here today. Um, 
So we're going to ask our panelists, they're going to share information about their um, personal experiences, professional experiences, additional tools, tips, and, and things for all of us to take away to support the community. And before we get started, I want to let folks know that we um, used our prompts today. We used the responses during registration. So if you asked a question during registration, we'll, we'll try to hit it in our kind of um, plan prompted discussion, but at the end, we'll also have a Q&A. So we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for additional questions. Um, so if you do have questions, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen, and, and we'll get to as many of those as we can kind of towards the end of the hour. Um, the first thing that's going to pop up in your Q&A section is a link to a glossary of terms. Um, so as you know, language is ever evolving, and we'll be using, you know, lots of words. Um, but we want to give you the glossary to kind of use as a reference during our discussion, but also as a resource after our discussion. So for example, I've been using LGBTQIA+. Um, so all of that is in your glossary, but it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual, and then a number of other identities that fall under that same umbrella. Um, but go ahead and use that. And if you have questions about any of those, you can just put it in the chat and we'll, we'll try to get to them at the end. All right, so let's get started. Um, so first we're gonna um, go over to Tyreek. We, we were wondering if you were able to share any information about um, hurdles towards maintaining mental health for members of our community and maybe um, how, how members of our community potentially have um, barriers to accessing mental health care. Yes, yes, um, thank you for that question. Um, I definitely think one of the biggest hurdles is finding culturally affirming um, wellness providers, right? People who have the same lived experience as you. If you're part of the community, you want to seek out help, you know, from people who look like you, people who have, you know, experienced the same things that you experience, people who identify the way you identify. And so I think that's a really big barrier in accessing um, mental health wellness providers and maintaining your mental health in a lot of ways is having access to people and um, communities and things that really speak to who you are and your culture and um, your identity. And so I think that's really, really big and the barriers to access. Yeah, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Um, and then trying to find people who, who represent who you are so <laughs> that they can they can kind of understand where you're coming from before, you know, even, even you have to explain it yourself. Right. And JP, have you had any similar experiences about accessing care, maybe having, you know, representative culturally affirming providers? Yeah, absolutely. Just like Tariq said, finding somebody who is representative of our community, somebody who looks like us, somebody who's gone through similar experiences and is just competent in the area. Um, you know, it's been really difficult throughout my life to find somebody who is you know, gender affirming, somebody who is competent when it comes to sexuality, um, somebody who's going to ask specific questions that are actually detailed and uh, oriented to my life as a queer individual, um, which most of the time I don't get. So it's definitely been difficult, but um, the good thing is that there's been more of a push for queer competent uh, providers in every field. Um, so they're starting to come out there and we're starting to build that community, which is great, but it's definitely been difficult throughout the years. Yeah, absolutely. And Early, you, you identify as a member of the community and also provide services. Do you think that gives you a, a different perspective? I think it does. I think anytime someone has lived experience, um, we can bring something new to the table. It doesn't mean that someone has to have lived experience to be able to help. Um, and provide services to people who are LGBTQI+. Um, but, but there are some benefits to having that lived experience um, and to understand the journey and some of the hurdles that might get there. I think another problem in accessing um, helpful mental health is there's still a huge stigma um, that's out there um, regarding mental health, but also you know, it's not always safe to come out um, as a member of this population. And so, we still have a lot of work to do with advocacy and spreading the word. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also important to consider um, when accessing care, also the, the kind of legacy of discrimination within mental health um, for LGBTQIA folks. Um, and that that might not always be a, a safe supportive space. Um, 
and I know that that, that can be true in, in lots of, of realms. I know um, one thing that we discussed, and, and maybe JP, you could speak to this too, but um, kind of the over the intersectionality of, of religion and LGBTQ identities and, and mental health. Um, would you like to share a little bit about your experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so growing up on both sides of my family uh, are very devout Catholics. And my grandfather on my uh, mom's side was actually uh, a deacon in our church. And so growing up, the church was in everything that I did. I went to church every Sunday. I went to youth group every Wednesday. I was baptized. I went to vacation Bible school, you named it. And then when I started to understand um, and that I was different and that um, I, you know, uh, my sexual orientation was, you know, not like everybody else. I was like, this is really difficult for me because I grew up believing that homosexuality was a sin. And so I really struggled and I kept it to myself. I got depressed. I was very anxious because of it. And when I actually came out to the priest at our church, um, the message that I received from him was, you're going to go straight to hell. And the fact that this person who I looked up to and was a family friend as well, just told me that scared me. Um, I really, really fell into a deep depression because of that. Um, but eventually I noticed that after time went by, I was like, I'm still feeling this way. And so I decided to choose myself over my religion. And I actually turned my back on my religion for pretty much the rest of my life. Um, I find now that I'm more of a spiritual person and I connect in different ways. Um, but that's just my experience. And there's so many other people who experience similar things um, or worse. Um, so it definitely affects um, myself as uh getting to know myself and accepting and loving myself, but it also affects my mental health as well. Yeah, absolutely. And trying to find the, the balance between, you know, faith and spirituality and, you know, even like family traditions with religion and, you know, affirming also your, your identity now can be a, a real struggle and something that a lot of people need support with. Absolutely. And there's so many wonderful people in churches now that are more diverse, progressive, yeah, yeah. and inclusive. And so a lot of people have been able to find that connection now and that community, which is fantastic. Um, I'm super thankful that we um, are seeing people move forward and being more progressive with that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I'll add as, you know, having some lived experience with that, as well as um, being a therapist for individuals, a lot of people have experienced religious trauma um, when they have like similar to what JP said, the messages are sent that you're going to hell or you're um, going to be ostracized or rejected in every faith, not just Christianity, but um, I've worked with people who are Muslim and Jewish and Hindu, and it, it just is still a significant problem. Um, I know that for myself, I'm adopted. And when I reached out to meet my biological parents, my biological father, um, was a Southern Baptist minister and essentially met me once and then didn't have contact for like 15 years until he told my sisters about me. And so that rejection was so painful. Um, and my biological mom also rejected me because of me being lesbian. And so it brings a lot of pain um, when people use religion to justify their hate or their um, just not understanding things. I grew up in a church and we did have a pastor that came and was very obviously gay and the church sent him away. And so again, that mixed message, I didn't come out till I was in my twenties because of that fear of what, what was it going to be like? So. Yeah. And I think that that's a really good point when we think about, um, kind of this, this increase in anxiety and depression and, and substance misuse, that a lot of it can be from, from environment, right? From experiences, from discrimination, from fear of, of what will happen with coming out from confusion, conflicting thoughts, you know, and, and you know, it's important for folks supporting our community to be aware of all of those external factors that could be going on for, for someone. Um, well, and, and also the human rights campaign has like a ton of like amazing resources on their website. Um, they especially have like a section on different religions. And so it has some great like things you can just download for free about people who are um, Muslim or Christian or Jewish, like a big array. 
And so it's really helpful if someone is struggling with their spirituality. Um, you know, I totally understand rejecting it. And I totally understand like coming to a new understanding like I did. I, I just had to find my people who were accepting and who, you know, read the like holy um, books in a way that fit for me and wasn't rejecting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I like the way you said that too about finding my people because I think that, you know, maybe we can all imagine what that was like for each of us too in our, our you know, our personal lives, our professional lives that you, you kind of find your community, you find your, your people, um, you know, and maybe your people weren't the people who are around your entire life, but you have people now. Um, Terry, do you want to talk a little bit about the role of, of community um, in supporting LGBTQ folks and their kind of overall mental health and well-being? Yes, yes. Community is is very, very important. Um, I wanted to go back to that religion. Like um, I, too, was a person that grew up. Um, I grew up Islamic, you know, and so I had a really, really big turning point where I knew my identity as being queer did not align with my you know, spiritual belief in Islam. And at a young age. Right. Um, and we're going to talk about youth a little bit in this panel, but at a young age, I was forced to decide, you know, between being a Muslim and being queer. Mm -hmm. And I had to really find that on my own. And I think that's a lot of pressure, right? As a, you know, 14 year old decided between your faith and your identity in that way. And um, I just remember making that big decision that I was going to, you know, love myself, which was, you know, my identity, you know, as being queer, but also trying to find a mid, you know, a mid, middle point in what my religion um, or spirituality is. So it's kind of like what they were saying, I end up being like a mosh pit of like all these different um, spiritualities. And, um, you know, I'm not really into religion as much anymore, but I do consider myself um, a person who, you know, was raised Islamic, but then got baptized at 16 because I had this belief that, um, you know, my faith, there was faith in me being queer, but I just, it just takes me back to uh, being so young and having to make those kind of decisions, those life changing decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Where like, there's no space for both. And I think that's why community is important. Or like she was saying, finding your people is important because you have to find space that kind of holds you you know, holistically, who you are spiritually, who you are, you know, um, we talk about sexual orientation or identity, um, culturally. And when you don't have those spaces, you all, you find yourself having to choose, like, which, you know, what is more important to you, like what identity means the most to you. And I don't think we have to anymore, right? We, we should be able to find space. And if we're not finding those spaces, I think it's up to the community to hold space for people that have those intersectionality identities. And um, I think community will save lives, you know, and um, it's our responsibility to kind of do that work, hold those spaces for our um, queer people, because a lot of us are, you know, intersectional, right? We all, we, we come to the table with many, many different identities and many, many different spiritual beliefs. And so I think community is a space for that, that we got to hold for each other in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. Thank you for sharing that. Um, JP, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I know we've, we've had conversations too about just kind of even this concept of like family of choice. Um, and when it comes to community, do you want to kind of explain what that is for folks? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, you know, my family was uh, very Catholic growing up and we're blood related. I love my family. Um, over the years, um, our relationships have deteriorated for a number of different reasons, um, but I still love them. But I've always found that my family, the people who I truly go to, who support me, love me, accept me for all my fabulous self is my only choice. And that are, that's my closest friends and my closest people who I've known for almost 20 plus years now, who we've been through a number of different experiences. Um, we've helped each other when we're at our worst, we're there when we're at our best. And my family of choice, the people who I've decided to let into my life and be part of my life in, in such a deep way um, has just been the most amazing experience and what has really been able to help me feel free genuine, authentic, uh, and just, you know, I don't have to hide who I am. I can just love who I am and they love me freely for who I am. And so that's been a really big thing. And we see that a lot in our community, um, especially if we grow up in families who are religious, um, who end up um, disowning us or pushing us out. 
we have to create that family. Um, and so as Tariq was saying, we create it by, you know, finding people who are like us, who have similar experiences, um, finding people who can celebrate and enjoy us um, in just the way that we want to be celebrated and enjoyed. Um, so it makes a really big difference. And um, I couldn't be happier that I have such an amazing group um, of individuals and um, it's really made my life just a hundred times better. So it's been great. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Having having a family of choice, having a community is, is really important. And I think, you know, kind of what um, both of you were saying and even early too a bit ago is sort of this idea of when you find the people who accept every part of you or who understand every part of you, you feel better. Right. So if we think about any of our clients, friends, coworkers, neighbors, community members, um, you know, if you're a person who's who's cisgendered heterosexual and you, you uh, want to be a good ally, I think that's a good thing to think about with, you know, the people we feel the best around are the people that celebrate us and, and understand different parts of us and accept all the parts of us instead of just, you know, putting that one part aside, but accepting all these other parts. Um, I think we can all kind of unanimously agree that doesn't feel good um, and definitely not nearly as good as people who accept all of us, for sure. I know, I see the smiles, I'm like, it's such a nice feeling. <laughs> um, I think let's let's have a conversation because I know it's it's Pride Month and I think something that happens a lot during Pride Month is people come out. Um, and I know we're you know we all coming out all the time in different ways and different scenarios, um, but I think you know it's possible that some people joining us today maybe had somebody come out to them for the first time. Um, and so I thought um, maybe early, do you wanna share a little bit about kind of um, the coming out process, what, what, what went well, what didn't um, for you? Yeah, definitely. I, I've noticed that the coming out process really is different for different people. Some are like readily, like, I don't care. I'm just going to be who I am. And, um, you know, it's, it also for them, it might work really well. They might have supportive people already set up um, that they know are going to be there no matter what. Um, for others, it's choosing between their family and, you know, like JP was saying, or, um, you know, being with people that they choose to be with as part of their family. I, I know that when I work a lot with teenagers who teens normally go through, like identity development is, is one of their, like, things they're supposed to do in, like, middle school and high school. And so I, a lot more um, teens I work with are questioning. And I think it's great because just 12 years ago, there weren't teens that were coming and saying, I wonder you know, what my pronouns should be, or I wonder you know, what gender or sexual orientation I am. So I do think that there's been some movement even just in the last 12 years that I've been doing therapy um, to like have a little bit more room to question. I know that the coming out process um, does tend to be easier if like families start really young with like having books that are about, you know, diverse individuals, right? There was a huge uproar in a school that read the book about, um, I'm blanking on the name of it, but the one about the penguins, the two male penguins. It's tango and was it Tango was the penguin? Yes. It's that. Yeah, I have it over like here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know why I'm blanking on the name, but anyway, like, a school freaked out and there was a huge like big rally about it to say like, this is horrible. We shouldn't be teaching this to our kids. But I feel like the people that have a better experience with coming out have had exposure to people with diverse families, have read books, have watched movies, um, really have educated themselves. And we know that like something that helps with resiliency is having at least one adult like be there for them and hear them and stand out. So like, I remember in high school, I had a biology teacher that was gay and I was like, wow, he was kind of pretty open and out there. And I was like, what is this? Like, this is strange, right? So, you know, I felt safe to go and talk to him some versus like other people I didn't know if they were gonna be safe. So for me, I, I was too scared and exploring, you know, since I was in elementary school, figuring out who I was. And it wasn't until my 20s that I came out. And um, it's something that for me, I found my life partner. We've been together, it'll be 25 years later this year. And when I met her, I was like, I can't, I can't like deny it anymore. <laughs> I want to do this for my life. I think I better tell my family and other people. And, and some people reacted well, like my dad, who surprisingly I was terrified to tell, and my stepmom told. He was like very cool and he was like, oh, I thought that. 
Whereas my mom, who I thought would be more accepting, like she went through a lot of grief um, for that process and, and transferred that grief onto me, wondering, is this a phase? And yeah. oh my gosh, you're never going to get married or have kids, which I have. I have to adopt a daughter <laughs> who I love. I got, you know, celebrate yeah. three anniversary. 25 years is a good run too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm pretty Definitely. sure lots of parents would be very proud to have children in healthy, loving relationships for 25 years with two grandkids, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yes, um, I think also, she's come around. Like yeah. she's definitely open and free. Yeah, um, I, I wonder too, because I think something that you said sounded really interesting too, because I remember that moment for, for myself and I'm wondering if Tariq or JP, this resonates with you either. That moment where you're like, look, I, can't, I just can't deny this anymore. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is happening um, and I kind of have to figure out how to, how to navigate the world knowing this, this truth about myself. Um, was that true at all for you, Tariq? I mean, yeah, like I think from what I remember, my mom just asked me, I think she found a letter that I had wrote to like my boyfriend and she, and she asked me, I was like, well, I mean, you can't deny a love letter, right? And it was like right there. And so I had to come out, mm -hmm. but it also brings up to, you know, a little bit around the topic of the, you know, coming out for me. Um, it is a process that I respect. It's a process that I've been through. It's a process we've all, you know, kind of talked about on this panel. But in a lot of ways, I kind of advocate for like getting rid of the process of coming out because I believe that, you know, it is not our responsibility to come out to the world. The world should be embracing us from the beginning. And I try to tell this a lot with like parents or family members and different community members that like, you know, cause I get asked all the time, well, I think my um, daughter is, or I think I was like, what did you ask? You know, like <laughs> it's daughter. And if it's your son, and it's, and when I say this, I know that it's not an easy feat. I know that it's hard for parents to Freeze. We'll give him just a second to see if he bounces back because I want to hear more about this <laughs> kind of ending the coming out process because it's really intriguing to me. Well, and while we wait, I can add that there's definitely a movement instead of coming out to inviting in. And so as an like LGBTQI individual, um, being able to like invite people into my world and to yeah. It's not like necessarily me coming out to them. It's like saying like, this is who I am and I'm inviting you and trusting you with this knowledge. And I think that probably for, um, you know, the people who are, who are joining us, who maybe have a family member, friend, coworker, you know, client, anything, um, to think about it that way too, that people are inviting you into this. Um, they're inviting you into this space of their life, this part of their identity. Uh, and sharing that experience with you was probably sounds really nice. Like I would love to be invited into somebody's identity and experiences um, as opposed to expecting them to come out to me. You know, that sounds much better. Yeah, an important part of that too is a lot of people unfortunately make the mistake of believing that if someone like comes out or invites you in that you have free reign to share that with other people. And that is not okay. Like there's truly are safety issues for individuals in employment, at schools, and a lot of places where, you know, we have to identify who we think is safe. And are we at a place in our own like mental health and well-being that we can like deal with those attacks or or people that aren't um, like as comfortable and want to um, you hate. And so I think that people need to remember that just because someone invites you in and shares something about their sexual identity or gender identity or expression, that that's not, that's not your story to tell. Yeah. And you should always ask permission. So for instance, I go to a religious place where there's a lot of LGBTQI individuals and my um, adopted daughter, um, we just adopted them like two years ago. Um, she had never met anyone who was trans. And I was like, oh, okay. I didn't just say, well, this person and this person and this person are yeah. trans. <laughs> like, no, I went and I personally talked to each of them. And I said, my daughter is wondering, like, would you be willing to either for me to share or for you to share, you know, that you're trans and 
kind of share a little bit of your experience. And some said yes, and some said no. It wasn't like they weren't out at work, like there were a lot of different things that they feared. So I think it's important to ask before sharing anything. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Tariq is back. Yay. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, we're still talking about coming out um, and we were we were talking, um, we wanna hear more about this process of eliminating coming out, but we were also talking about, um, it kind of got into outing other people um, and, and you know, kind of making sure that you're not doing that. And if somebody is like inviting you into that part of your life, it doesn't mean that it's uh, kind of free for you to share with other people. So that's, that's where we were, but um, yeah, continue telling us about this, this kind of like eliminating the coming out process. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry about technical. <laughs> I don't you know what happened. Oh, what it happened. Happened. Um, but yeah, like I was saying that, you know, I know it's difficult for parents to take that responsibility, but I think, you know, if, you know, we're talking about youth again, you know, you should be able to ask your children, you know, if that's something that they're um, dealing with, if, you know, the identity, you know, are you, are you experiencing, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to be a part of the trans community? Are you experiencing these things? I think we, we should take the burden because as I still meet with clients and I'm still talking to you, it's still a lot. Like, you know, I came out 20 years ago and the pressure was heavy then. The pressure has always been heavy. And we're in year 2021 and we're still putting in a lot of mental, you know, struggles on our youth to come out, you know, this big old process. When I think that, you know, as adults, as community, as friends, we can ask. It's not a, a taboo thing anymore. It's not the end of the world if you ask, you know. Um, and going back to what you guys were saying, of course, if they do say that I'm gay, you know, that's between you and that person. You know, we don't want to out and, you know, disclosure is very, very, you know, important when people do share who they are and they're not ready for the world. But I think if we begin to have those conversations with people um, and parents, if you begin to have those conversations with your children, um, we take some of that burden off of our youth. You know, it's a, it's a lot of mental burden that we put on our queer communities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Tariq, you make a, a good point too, that if, if um, so if you're gonna ask these questions, which again, like it, it kind of just says like, it's okay, we can talk about what this is, right? And then I think that the response of somebody does say that they're queer, gay, trans, any of it um, is then educating your yourself, right? Because kind of like you, I got kind of called out. Um, <laughs> you know, a woman sent me flowers. My mom's like, why is this woman sending you flowers? And I was like, well, I mean, <laughs> um, but but then we never, then we didn't talk about it again for another seven years. So she asked and then just kind of went silent. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, it's out there, but we're not talking about it. Right. So I think, you know, kind of just adding on to what you were saying to ask, but then continue the discussion and educate yourself and find resources and talk to people, um, you know, so that you can continue the conversation. Um, and I also think that, like we said, the role of, of parents or teachers are having someone. I know, JP, you had a like a, a kind of a teacher um, and somebody in your life who made, made the difference for you in terms of coming out and being comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, when I was um, going through my um, my identity crisis of trying to figure out who I was, um, as I mentioned before, like I dealt with a lot of depression, uh, depression, anxiety, self harm. I also used and abused alcohol and drugs to be able to cope. And it was literally one day in high school. Um, our guidance counselor, her name's Jinx Lacey. Uh, may she rest in peace. Um, she literally just came up to me and was like something's wrong. You don't seem yourself. What's going on? And at that moment, like having somebody come up to me and just say like, what's going on? Um, just literally changed my life. Um, she immediately put me into what now I know is group therapy, um, where I actually started to connect and learn from other um, youth, other teens in my school that they were going through something very similar. Um, and it, cause I really felt like I was alone and it was me against the entire world. And so the fact that I had community and the fact that people were dealing with this as well and dealing with the depression, dealing with the anxiety and the stress of it as well. I was like, oh my gosh, like, okay, this is a thing, right? It's not just me. And then from there, I was able to go into my own individual therapy. I came out to my mom there. Um, and then it just kind of really set this like precedence for like, this coming out process that was 
both great and a struggle as well. Um, and so, yeah, it made a really big difference for me, just having that one person make a difference. And because of her is actually the biggest reason of why I work in mental health and why I'm an, uh, a career advocate, educator, um, and up and coming therapist as well, because I wanna do that for somebody. One person can literally save a life. Checking in, asking how you're doing or supporting and loving somebody unconditionally. Um, and also, I just kind of want to remind people that the process or the, I, I love the inviting in process, is something we do lifelong. Like, this is something we take everywhere we go. We have to decide, am I comfortable with telling somebody? Um, are they going to tell somebody else? Am I going to get fired for this? Am I going to get harassed? So it's a very scary process. So think about what that does to our mental health, right? It makes us anxious. It makes us stressed, uh, depressed you name it, right? Um, I came out at an early age um, for my sexual orientation, but I actually just came out last year in November on coming out day, my gender identity. Like I'm 36 years old and I'm just coming out as gender queer, which I love, but it's taken me that much time to be able to focus my attention on one part of my identity and get through it and be happy and healthy than to be able to focus my attention on another part of my identity. Um, so it does a, a lot to our, our, you know, mental, physical health. And, uh, but again, if we can have just one person make a difference, it changes our life forever. Absolutely. I also struggled with significant depression and anxiety and still struggle with anxiety, but um, a lot of it did start about the identity crisis and, you know, feeling just struggling with um, worries of rejection and, hate and I had, I had seen other people um, not like have positive experiences. And so it was definitely scary. I just wanted to add about the piece of, you know, having people question. I think that people need to be careful though and do it in a very thoughtful way. And that maybe leading up to asking that question, maybe like putting things out there of like, you know, oh, I watched this movie or I read this book or like there's signs that I know people are safe, right? If they have a pride flag in their office, like I'm going to feel a little bit more safer coming out to them or, or inviting them in. Um, you know, I think that families can do that as well is to, you know, be involved in the community, get to know the history um, and be able to like create the safety I know my biological mom wrote me a letter after I knew her for three years and I did, she did meet my wife and I did not come out to her at that time, um, but wrote me a letter saying, I don't mean to be motherly, but is your friend gay? Because if you hang around with gay acting people, people are going to think that you're gay. <laughs> not a good way to ask no. a question. I was like, that just made my depression worse. And I eventually came out to her and then she rejected me. Um, but it's actually like, I do have loving people. My adoptive parents are amazing and love me and love my wife. Um, and it's, you know, but there are other family members that are not like that. And so I, again, asking a question, someone might still fear, like, are they going to reject me? Um, I, I'm working with, you know, teens now that, that struggle with that and wonder, like, you know, so if a parent came to them and asked, they might feel that they're going to be rejected based on their religion or based on like attitudes of what other people have shared. I think you make a really good point too early about those um, kind of like hints and, and things that we can all see and, and they can be positive or, or negative, right? So I can see you have a, the flag in the background there. And so I'm like, okay, early might be a, a safe space to, to share this information. Um, but the same thing happens, you know, on the other end of the spectrum with, with what we see in our families and parents and friends. So my, my grandmother was queer and she was in a relationship with a woman and we just never talked about it. We just referred to her as our aunt and we just never talked about it. And I, I, I remember thinking later when I kind of went through my own journey with my identity, and thinking like, oh my gosh, Aunt Maria was grandma's partner for 10 years, but just no one talked about it. And I, and I think my experience of understanding my sexual orientation would have been a lot different had somebody said, here's a role model for you and someone you can talk to. But it was, you know, you don't talk to the kids about it and then the kids don't understand it. And, you know, just kind of that, that secrecy um, 
kind of set a tone that that, that was what was necessary um, for people who identified that way or were part of that community. So I think you can kind of set the tone for, for openness or you can set the tone for secrecy um, and, and just being aware that you, you can probably be doing both. Um, I know that we we also want to get to a point where we're sharing resources with people. Um, so I want to make sure I know everybody is kind of very involved with their communities. Um, I think we all kind of do that too, right? Like we we're all part of the community and then we all give back to the community <laughs> in different ways. Um, so I kind of want to go around and ask each of you just for like maybe like your top two or three resources um, for supporting our community. So let's start with uh, we'll start with JP and then we'll go um, Tyreek and then early. So JP, what are your just kind of like two or three like big biggest resources? Absolutely. Um, so my biggest resources that I like to connect people to is Out Youth. Um, so Out Youth is a local LGBTQ plus organization that focuses on helping youth. Um, they provide a drop-in space. They also provide clinical services as well. Um, and really great is they um, actually just opened up their services a little bit more. So I want to say they're now um, working with a nine and up um, because we've been seeing a lot so that you know uh, younger youth are coming out so um out youth is fantastic um, i always like to um give a big shout out to the kind clinic the kind clinic is ex extremely inclusive and affirming um they can be able to help you with medications hormone therapy you name it and then um your local PFI chapter um great place to be able to connect for parents or wanting support as their child is coming out. Um, you can be able to talk about it. You can be in support groups. You can be able to share, get resources. So those are probably my three that I would uh, recommend today. Awesome. You said P flag yes. for people. Flag. Okay. Just making sure we had, yeah. Which is it? It's like parents and friends. Parents of... and friends of lesbians and gays. Yeah. But also now it's, you know, again, we're a whole sure. umbrella now. <laughs> so it's all of the, the the whole the whole alphabet really um so thank you so out you um kind clinic and p flag and there's local chapters of p flag and both kind clinic and out youth are our local um organizations i think kind clinic just opened in san antonio too um yeah they opened it thing yeah <laughs> um okay yeah terry what are your kind of like two or three biggest uh, resources for people yes yes so i always definitely um connect people to western america uh, we just launched a program in um, January. It's our Connect to Care program. And with this program, it is uh, free services where we connect people to a therapist of their choice, or we will select a therapist for you that we have vetted during a culturally affirming process. And we will pay up to three sessions and a consultation for you for free. So basically, just file the application. Uh, we do our programming around people living with HIV, communities of color, and all the queer community and identities. And so the program is for everyone though, but we like to make sure that we, um, you know, market to the communities that sometimes don't have, you know, the same access to mental health services. But it's for anyone, just file an application. You can come with your own therapist, we'll pay for it. If you don't have a therapist, you don't have the means to get, um, pay for it, we would do both for you. Uh, we also launched our newest program, Trans Connect, which emphasizes, you know, just for trans identifying people. And we are also vetted therapists across Texas that specialize in working with gender nonconforming and trans identifying people. And the same process, fill out application, boom, we would connect you. We are believing, you know, to cut the red tape, right? You know, like we don't want to go yeah. through all of that. We don't, you know, fill out the application, we would connect you, we will pay for it. And the last thing I like to use as a resource for people is peer support. As a, as a mental health peer specialist, I like to let people know that that's out there. Integral Care has peer support, you know, um, different organizations across um, Austin locally have peer support. And I think it's a really good resource for youth and adults who are looking for that opportunity to be connected. So those are my resources. Yeah, absolutely. That's so exciting. I mean, it's what's in the mirror. And I'm sure I think after this, we're, we'll follow up with an email for all attendees um, and, and link to some of those. But that's a really exciting organization. Um, early, two or three favorite resources for people. Definitely. Well, I agree with both of y'all. You took one or two that I was going to share. So I'll share some others. 
Um, online, um, I already mentioned HRC has like a lot of fabulous information for families, for the, you know, we want to change the coming out process, but it does say coming out process on there. Um, it's, it's just wonderful. Um, another, two other online resources is a, a lot of people will put like our, identify our pronouns as we introduce ourselves or on our emails or different things like that. Um, I link um, right after that, um, like for instance, on my email, to a um, website called mypronouns.org. And so it explains like, why are we putting our pronouns? Like, what, what's the big deal? Like, what is they, them? What is these, they, them? Like, it, it explains like that and, and the importance of it um, on there. And then there's a great organization um, called Safe Zone Project, which has a free training that you can download that's really helpful for allies for people who just want to increase like therapists, school counselors, like anyone, doctors who wants to also increase their awareness of LGBTQI um, like um, issues that that there are. And then the last two things I have to add two more. Go There's for it. <laughs> crisis hotlines out there. And I know especially the youth I work with, um, they love like the crisis text line, which you text home to 741741. I refer them to our integral care helpline as well. Um, I, I refer them to the Trevor Project. Like there's, there's so many just abundant resources out there. And so, you know, it's helpful if you want to be an ally to also like find these resources and educate yourself and not expect someone who is part of the community to educate you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, share as many as you want. I said two or three, but we, we can never have too many. Um, I do think that that's actually something interesting you touched on that I don't think we've, we've talked about here, but maybe we can throw it in really quickly as the conversation around pronouns. Um, and I know that can be really hard for folks and, and, and identifying your pronouns and using pronouns. People have a hard time with like singular they, them. Um, but I was reading a recent study from the Trevor Project that said that using a person's pronouns can reduce suicide attempts by 50% in trans youth, which is a huge reduction. So if you think about it that way, essentially using pronouns that, that people um, used to identify themselves is suicide prevention. It, it really is. So, you know, it's, it, it's sometimes people find it a little clumsy and it requires some practice and some educating yourself, but, you know, it's, it's suicide prevention. And if we want to talk about, you know, mental health and overall well-being, respecting a person's pronouns, respecting a person's name, respecting a person's identity is going to go a long way to their overall well-being um, and, and maybe even save their life. It's, it's a huge conversation. Um, I am going to take a quick look at our, our question box. Um, first of all, everyone loves y'all. <laughs> They're all really happy that you're here. Um, people want lists from the webinar, um, for, or from the webinar of resources, and we will be sending those. Um, I have a question, here's a good one, about peer support specialists. Um, does anybody know of any organizations that have youth and teen peers? Um, I think Out Youth may, may have some, but I'm not sure. Do, does anyone know? So um, I know that what Out Youth typically does, I, I volunteered there for a few years and I did my internship there as well, is that whenever there's a new uh, person in the space, what they do is they partner them up with somebody who's been in the space for a while. Um, that way they have somebody who they can connect with, who can share um, the space with them, teach them about all the different resources and opportunities. Um, so we have that and the, the kids in that space are always fantastic about just naturally being like, you're new, tell me about you. <laughs> What's your pronouns? What do you like to do? Because they found their people. <laughs> Absolutely. It's very welcoming. But yeah, they typically try and pair somebody up with somebody else who's been there for a while um, just to kind of uh, decrease some of that like anxiety. Yeah, and I know that there's also, um, so I, I used to be on the board of Waterloo Counseling Center before it became part of, of Kind Clinic. Um, and they've been around for, I think it's 36 years now. Um, they started during the, the AIDS crisis um, back in the 80s, providing mental health services. Um, and they're free, sliding scale, all that, but they also have um, groups. Um, and so you can do kind of a group therapy thing and then they'll have like transmasculine groups and then they, they will do groups different ages too. Um, so if you look up Waterloo Counseling as part of Kind Clinic, there's there's free and affordable kind of peer groups for trans masculine folks, trans feminine folks. Um, I think there was one that was like folks living with HIV who identified as bisexual. You know, you can you can find your your group. Um, and I know that they've done them for teens too in the past. 
I don't have the, the latest because um, I, I haven't been affiliated for about maybe a year now, but they, they did have those. Um, we have another really good question here. Um, what advice would you give for counselors, clinicians, social workers, specifically how to be an ally and make your clients feel safe when your employer isn't necessarily the friendliest? Um, so maybe you're trying to be an ally in your role, but maybe the, the overall agency um, or employer isn't necessarily on board. Um, maybe early, do you have some? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a hard one. Um, it's, it is difficult to advocate sometimes with upper management if they are not receptive and open. Fortunately, the places I've worked have been, like I've, I've been very like grateful for that. Um, you know, it's, it's something that a way to advocate, I think, as you can still like use the pronouns on your email, you can still like um, display like a pride flag, um, you can still like introduce yourself with pronouns. So there are still things you could do individually. Um, and, and people might ask like, oh, you know, what is that? And then maybe like talking to other coworkers, sharing the statistics about suicide, about mental health and substance use, I think is also really powerful to sway um, maybe others, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think the other thing that, that I would add to that too is um, one of the things I think about being an ally to, to the LGBTQIA community is, is recognizing where you have power and privilege. And so, you know, there I've had jobs where I did not come out because I was worried um, about my job, my coworkers, any of that. Um, but for folks who are allies to maybe kind of like take some of the heat for putting the flag in your office, you know? Um, you know, if your employer is not the friendliest, if you're a person who, who feels passionately about supporting the community and being a, a true ally, um, you could kind of use some of your, your power and your privilege to, to make a change at the agency um, as a person who, you know, doesn't necessarily worry about losing their job because they're queer. Um, so yeah, I think, I think being an ally is, is an opportunity to, to kind of put yourself kind of in, the, in that front line of trying to change the culture um, at a workplace. Um, we have another good uh, question. Oh, go ahead, Jamie. Well, I was just gonna ask um, early as a therapist um, and you know, uh, being part of the community and working with the community, um, what would you say are some best practices in terms of like uh, treatment modalities, oh, yeah. whether it's your attachment base, whether it's like CBT narrative, um, what would you, um, have you found is extremely helpful for our community? Absolutely. So I know for teenagers, um, I'm trained in attachment-based family therapy, and there's been a lot of research on how that can really help bridge the gap between teenagers and their parents, really activating um, their caregiving instinct and, and see the seriousness. Like I've had to be very blunt with a parent um, to say, you know, who was totally against their teenager who was coming out as trans, um, would not use the, the chosen name or pronouns. The teenager wanted a binder. The parent was like, no, that's like torture. You're not going to do that to yourself. The teenager wanted to consider hormones to kind of pause the puberty. Um, process. And this, this parent was like, no, by the end of attachment-based family therapy, this parent who the teenager, and even me, I thought about giving up, finally, like, was able to use the name correctly, use the correct pronouns, did even help buy a binder um, for this teenager. Like, it was just, it's wonderful. And I've used that model for a lot of people I use EMDR, um, I'm certified in that. I think it can be really helpful for the grief process if, if that happens, it doesn't happen with everybody, but for some people there's a lot of grief in being rejected by families, peers, friendships might change. Um, so EMDR is really great for that. I also love sand train expressive arts, it can be very healing um, for those things as well. And by the way, just to throw in there, if you, if you do do sand tray, um, which is where you have a lot of miniatures and literally there's metaphor and narrative that goes into them putting things in the sand. Make sure your miniatures are diverse, like <laughs> have like some androgynous, yeah. like looking sand tray miniatures, have like couples, like I have two brides that are women and I have two men and I have, you know, cultural diversity in, in my sand tray as well. So just being mindful again of, um, 
of like inclusivity in your office spaces and in your toys if you're a play therapist. Yeah, I agree. And even in your language too, um, you know, you can use they, them pronouns, other pronouns for people mm -hmm. um, when telling stories, when talking about things, you know, so that people understand that's kind of like a, like a little hint, like, you know, you can, yeah. you can do this around me. You can use singular they around me. And if that's how you identify, you can share mm -hmm. that with me. So we have one more question. I found out last year that a family member came out to his mother as gay. The family member did not come out to me personally, but I'd like to show my support as an ally somehow. Um, how would you suggest doing that? Tariq, do you wanna take this one first? Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of like touched on this a little bit already. Um, I think it starts with your, you. So if you wanna show support for the community at large, it's little things that you can do. You can, you know, go to a, a, a pride parade and maybe let that person know like, hey, I went to the pride parade, you know, open those, you know, those nuggets like we were talking about earlier. You don't have to go directly like, well, I heard you came out, you know, instead of doing that, be an ally to the community first. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, if you want to have a flag in your office, if you want to ask them, what are they pronouns? If you want, you know, do that in your own life. And then I think you would create a safe environment for that person to come to you, to, you know, know that you are an ally, that they can be safe to come to you and, you know, maybe talk about it. Maybe it's not even a question about coming out. Maybe y'all, the first conversation y'all have would be about the pride parade that you walked in last week. You know, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, about their, you know, sexuality. It could be about just who they are and you are creating that space for them to show up because you are showing up and already being an ally. So, um, you know, and I think that's important. You know, it's the way we live our lives. You can be an ally and not ever know one, anyone personally that might identify, you know, in this conversation that we have, but you can do the work in your everyday life that will make a difference. And it will trickle down to the people around you, your family circle, your friend circle, and then that's the bigger picture here. So yeah, I would say just do the things in your everyday life, then open up to that person. And I guarantee you the conversation will come organic, you know, naturally and stuff like that. Yeah. And also, you know, advocating. We have so many great organizations locally and nationally to be part of the process and advocating for legislation. I mean, it's ridiculous that not until what, six years ago, was it legal for me to be married in all states? Like that's, that is just there, like that's ridiculous. So we need to also to be a good ally, I think, um, and, and to show support for someone who might decide to invite you into their world is also sharing those opportunities for that maybe you choose to do for advocacy as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think all of those are great points too, because we, you know, there's kind of been a theme too, that it's not the, the process of, you know, coming out, identifying who you are, existing in the world, working, any of that, um, it's often influenced by the world around us, right? So it's not that, you know, like, I have no problem being queer. My problem is existing in a world that has a problem with me being queer. Um, and so, you know, one thing that allies can do, teachers, parents, therapists, anyone, is, is try to change the world around them, right, instead of the individual person. Um, because we're all fine. <laughs> it's, you know, it's the environment that we're in that causes that, you know, increased anxiety, depression, substance use that we, we were talking about before. You know, that health disparity doesn't exist because there's a difference for the population. Health disparity exists because of, of the stigma and the bias and even the trauma. Um, there's a question here. Somebody said, what if somebody had a really traumatic coming out experience and then went back into the closet? You know, is that something that anybody maybe here has experienced or do you know anyone who's experienced something like that? I've worked with some individuals where that's happened. Um, and, and a lot of it, again, is getting support, finding your people. Um, uh, it's really difficult, like if they are a teenager because they're still under their parents' kind of rules and house. Um, and it, I do a lot with, again, processing that grief and, and also giving them hope um, and, and sharing resources um, to like help connect them at the like GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance at their school, if there's one um, for, I have worked with adults as well. And um, again, it's, it's really validating them, hearing, holding space for them, their grief. Um, you know, we all need to be acknowledged, seen, heard, 
um, and accepted. Like we all need that as, as people, but LGBTQI plus, QIA plus individuals, I, I think that that's needed even more. Um, and so definitely providing those opportunities to, to have that and just help someone process um, that and, and give them hope for things to look forward to in the future. Yeah, and, I, and, and also letting people go at their own pace. Um, was there something you wanted to add, JP? Actually, just speaking to what you were saying, right? Going at your own pace, sometimes that includes having to take steps back and go back and pause it for safety reasons, for um, something traumatic that happened to you, and that's okay. You're taking care of yourself and you're doing what's best for yourself in that moment. Um, you know, as Early was saying, it does get better. There are ways you can connect with the community, um, especially now that everything's virtually. Um, and you'll be able to find that, you know, happiness, that community, you'll be able to be your authentic self, but in the moment, you're doing what's best for you. You're doing what's best for your, your health, your safety, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so I like to make sure I preface that with people that it's like, what you're doing is what's best. You know yourself better than anybody else. And if you have to take care of yourself, yes. you will get there eventually, right? It does take time. It does get better. But right now you're doing what's best for you. And I support you hundred percent. Sometimes just saying something as simple as that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, if you said that to me, JP, I'd feel so good. <laughs> just the way you sound like they do, they support me. Um, we're going to do just one last question because I know we only have a minute or two left. Um, and Tariq, somebody wanted to um, ask about how you've seen um, art impact people's experience with mental health, knowing that your organization also has kind of a, a focus on, on art and advocacy. Yeah, we've used art to change the world, to educate people, to show people what queerness can look like, what blackness can look like, what transness can look like. I think the art is, is education, and, you know, and if we flip it the other way for people as the artist, it is expression. You're able to let out some of the things that you can't say, you know, I might can't tell you this, but I can show you this in an artistic way. I can put my soul into, you know, what I wrote. I can put my soul into the way I sing and express myself. So I think it's a twofold when it comes to using art for mental health. It's a way for people to express themselves, to, you know, fight through depression, fight through anxiety, to really you know, do that work, but it also educates the community. And that's one of the main things for me. Some people, I can tell you something and you don't get it, but maybe you need to see a theatric, you know, production of what it means to be queer in this country or what it means to, you know, overcome, you know, biases and oppression and stuff like that. So I believe art is the, the beautiful expression of the world and um, it, art has always changed the world and it will continue to change the world. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so we are, we're at two o'clock um, that the hour flew by. Um, but I do, again, just, I want to thank you, Tariq, um, JP, Early, all of you for, for sharing your personal experiences, sharing your resources. We are going to follow up with everyone um, and provide a list of resources. It'll include things like what's in the mirror. Um, and thank you again for co-presenting with us at Integral Care. And um, yeah, so yeah, just honored to have the conversation, happy to be a part of it. And, and thank you all for, for coming and joining us. Thanks, Jessica, for moderating. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> you guys. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Early, Tariq. It was so great to get to be on this panel with you. Yeah. yeah. And the Integral Care Communications Thanks. team, we're behind the scenes making it all work. Yeah. <laughs>